Everybody. Thank you for being here. Those of you who are here in person, thank you for those of us, those who are joining us virtually this morning. This is the Wednesday morning, November 30th, 2022 session of the Portland City Council. Keelan, please call the roll. Good morning. Maps. Here. Rubio. Ryan. Here. Hardesty. Wheeler. Here. Now we'll hear from legal counsel on the rules of order and decorum. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor. Welcome to the Portland City Council. City Council is holding hybrid public meetings with in-person attendance in addition to electronic attendance. If you wish to testify before Council, in person or virtually, you must sign up in advance by visiting the Council agenda on the Council Clerk's webpage at www.portland.gov slash council slash agenda. You may sign up for communications to briefly speak about any subject. You must, may also sign up for public testimony on resolutions, reports, or the first readings of ordinances. Written testimony may be submitted at cctestimony at portlandoregon.gov. Your testimony should address the matter being considered at the time. When testifying, please state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Please disclose if you are a lobbyist. If you are representing an organization, <coughs> please identify it. For testifiers joining virtually, please unmute yourself once a council clerk calls your name. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during city council meetings so everyone can feel welcome, comfortable, respected, and safe. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. A timer will indicate when your time is done. Disruptive conduct such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If there are disruptions, a warning will be given that further disruption may result in the person being ejected for the remainder of the meeting. After being ejected, a person who fails to leave the meeting is subject to arrest for trespass. Additionally, Council may take a short recess and reconvene virtually. Thank you. Thank you. First up is communications. First individual, please, Keelan, item 980. Um, the group has requested to present together. Sure. Okay. I'll read all five. 980, request of Frank Blackston to address Council regarding Northwest NATO Parkway Safe Rest Village. 981, request of Tom Ulrich to address Council regarding Northwest NATO Parkway Safe Rest Village. 982, request of Alberto Santabala to address Council regarding Northwest NATO Parkway Safe Rest Village. 983, request of Adam Bolt to address Council regarding Northwest NATO Parkway Safe Rest Village and request 984, request of Kat Ulrich to address Council regarding public safety on Northwest NATO Parkway. Welcome. Come on up. And Keelan, can you see are the microphones on? I think they are. Okay, great. Uh, so you don't need to pull the microphones too close together, just like a foot, six inches is fine. And if you could just state your name for the record. And collectively you have 15 minutes, however you'd like to use it. Can I ask a quick question? Where sure. do you see the clock that yeah, tracks our time? Oh, uh, can they see it from where they're sitting? I don't know if he wants them. There you go. Oh, down there. Oh, right okay, there. good. Thanks. All right. I'm not sure oh, wait, a quick question. We have a presentation we'd like displayed at the same time. All right, there it is. I see it. Good morning. Thanks for being here. We appreciate it. Good morning, and uh, I, I drew the short short straw, so I'm the <laughs> initial spokesman. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Adam Bolt. My husband and I 
uh, bought here in the Pearl in March. Uh, I'm the baby of the group in terms of time in Portland. Uh, I'll be speaking uh, to introduce the group and neighbors for smart shelters, and then I have co-presenters. Uh, I want to first begin by saying that we do love Portland. We have family in Sherwood. We have family in Tigard. We spent three to four years looking, uh, including in Cannon Beach, and ultimately landed in Portland, because we love it and we do love the Pearl. Uh, we'd say that to say we're not here as another NIMBY group. We're really not. Um, we're here as a group that has partnered with the city, with a homeless shelter that's already across the street from many of us, and one right next door just really isn't uh, an option. With that said, uh, I'd like to mention a little bit about what Neighborhood for Smart Shelters is, and then I'll turn it over on some other issues. Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> Uh, I think there's one more, one back. Thank you. Uh, two back? There we are. Thank you. So my co-presenters are Frank Blackston, Alberto Santabella, and the Ulrichs. Um, I've already told you the name. And we are over 800 members of individuals and businesses that are opposed to a Northwest NATO riverfront SRV in an already densely populated area. Uh, I will tell you that number is creeping on 1,000. Uh, we support shelters. You will not hear one member of this group uh, put down par partnering or what makes you Portland unique in how it wants to do its part for the unsheltered. What you will hear is what we already put up with uh, does not have realistic security and safety protocols. And because of that reason, we cannot support another no low barrier shelter. Next slide, please. The last thing I want to talk about, and then turn it over to some people who have been here longer and you'll want to hear more from, are the DEQ issues. I will not belabor you with what is um, a highly technical and legal issue. It is the subject of a public information request that is due next week. But suffice it to say that the Union Station parcel uh, has had its problems in terms of contamination. Uh, it, the, Hor the, the Oregon Harbor of Hope, uh, was approved uh, at a very high rate and a very fast rate and was the subject of litigation in 2019. Uh, we fear something like that may be happening with the next site, uh, and that's the reason that we have submitted the public information request. Uh, next slide, please. Our initial research suggests uh, that the RAP was approved in one day. Uh, you know, Mr. Winkler, uh, may he rest in peace, uh, was involved in this next uh, site, and we have uh, significant, qu significant questions um, about that RAP. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> and the difficulty that this group comes to city council with is that we do not have answers. We've asked for things, we've asked for transparency, and we're not getting them. And unfortunately, um, we've had to hire two law firms and the most recent of which has uh, made its public information request, like I said, that is pending. But because we have a 1,000 members strong, we've been able to do what other neighbors may not be able to do, and that's go hire a law firm to find out exactly what is going on here. And that really leads into an issue that we're not seeing um, something from the city and concerns it, and that's transparency. Uh, with that, I thank you for the time, and I'll turn it over to my co-presenter, Mr. Frank Blackson. Great, thank you. Next slide, please. Up, oh, next slide. All right, hi everybody, my name is Frank Blackston. A brief statement about myself. I live in the Pearl. I live close to the Harbor of Hope shelter. Uh, I moved to Portland, Oregon in 2015. Love this city. Moved to the Pearl beginning of 2020. Love the area. But I, like everybody else, I have concerns. When it comes to a partnership perspective, we're doing our part. We already have a shelter in our neighborhood, the Harbor of Hope. The issue is, after it was put in place, the good neighbor agreement was not honored. The neighborhood was left to deal with issues that came with the shelter. Next slide, please. While, uh, one thing I want to point out on this presentation, these are all pictures from in front of Harbor of Hope and the proposed SRV site. These are just a few pictures. 
Uh, while a shelter can do great things, we all support shelters, they also bring unwanted issues to the neighborhood. We have told you this. Uh, so in addition to what you see in these pictures, we also have safety and security issues that will be addressed later in the presentation. And your response to this is you wanna place another shelter in our neighborhood, right next to an existing shelter we've told you has brought issues. So you're doubling down on an approach that sacrifices neighborhood safety, security, and livability. Next slide, please. I'm only gonna focus on two things on this slide. If you look at the pictures, these are from our neighborhood too. This is from behind a hotel very close to the Harbor of Hope. It's not just us that think there's gonna be issues, or know there's gonna be issues. Uh, even our neighborhood association has issued a resolution. The Pearl District Neighborhood Res Association has issued a resolution opposing the SRV for these reasons. Next slide, please. <coughs> So we've asked for meetings to discuss this. You've ignored us. The SRV team instead points to stakeholder meetings as neighborhood consultation, which is not the case. The meetings are between city and county agencies and a few hand-picked residents. The meetings are marked as private and minutes are not shared with us. Many meetings were canceled last minute. You've left neighborhood residents in the dark and excluded from the process. I have to state this again, we already have a shelter in our neighborhood, we cannot absorb another one. We have a petition against the proposed SRV. It already has 800 signatures, as you know, Adam noted, it's creeping up. 600 signatures have already been delivered to you. We have an additional 200 on its way. We still don't have a response from you. My question is, how many signatures do we need to deserve a response from you on this topic? Next slide, please. It's not just our neighborhood that is having issues with a shelter. I mean, we can all probably think of a few off the top of our head. Here's some pictures from some. Uh, but it boils down to this. The evidence is everywhere that shelters negatively impact their immediate neighborhood. Please do not put an additional shelter in our area. Thank you very much. And with that, I'm going to pass this to Al, who will talk about safety and security. Next slide, please. Next slide. Hello, I'm Al Sandabaya. I moved to Portland eight years ago, and I felt then this was the best city in the U.S. on all fronts. This has shifted 180 degrees. I've walked to work for seven of those years, and this year I had to start leaving a little bit later in the winter, purely due to being scared to walk through the streets in the Pearl before the sun came up. But the biggest pain I feel is the deterioration of the riverfront. When I first visited Portland the plan to, to plan the move, I stayed on NATO right by the Morrison Bridge. It was wonderful. The views of the river and the bridges and Tom McHale Park right across the street. Today, I wouldn't walk a dog at that park, much less take children. When I scouted the Pearl, I looked at the area around the fields and tanner parks, but I selected NABO specifically for the river. The greenway running along the back was the biggest single determinant for my selecting it. The first year I would walk down the Greenway on most summer nights and I would never have a worry going all the way down to Steel Bridge, even if it was starting to darken. Fast forward, no, I'm sorry, next slide please. Fast forward to today, NATO has become a slum and is getting worse. When I have to walk to Tom McCall Waterfront Park, I walk in the street with cars going by because both sidewalks are clogged with tents in the Steel Bridge area. While NATO is the significantly shortest route to my dentist, I instead walk up to 9th or 10th across and back down to avoid the same area. This, <clears throat> the River District Navigation Center was counterintuitively placed on the Riverfront Drive and attracted tents even while it was being built, before it even opened. When the SRV project was announced, the same happened on a much grander scale where the lot and the sidewalk was filled with approximately 50 camps in about a two-week period. We see attempts at cleanup, but the number of cleanups is easy to measure, but does not tell anything. What's important is that over the life of the Navigation Center, there have only been four non-consecutive weeks in four years where there were no campers within a block north or south of the center. That's failure in an area much smaller than the promised 1,000-foot good neighbor. And in that same four-year period, the 1,000-foot radius has never been cleaned, uh, taken note of station way. 
In addition to reports, I personally see people hiding in the bushes behind Albers Mills, enough to make me avoid the area, campers with fires down by the water in the same area, a fire in a tent with a propane tank that took out a car directly in front of Harbor of Hope, and an attack on two McCormick Pier residents. These last two could have caused the death of innocent people. I know a decent waterfront is possible because I've seen Vancouver turn theirs into a vibrant area for residents and businesses, even as ours declines. And so anyway, I'll pass it over. Uh, this is Cat Aldrich. Uh, next slide, please. Cat Aldrich, sorry. No, Hi, I'm Cat Aldrich. Um, I moved to McCormick Pier Condos in 2016. My husband and I, Tom. Uh, we've really enjoyed the community. There's a marina there. We have a boat. We have a boat slip and the Willamette Greenway. It's walkable and it's probably the most affordable um, property in all of Portland. Uh, with the pro proximity to the many shelters and services in Old Town, there have always been street people uh, as long as I've been here. When there was talk of adding another shelter in Old Town back in 2017 before the Harbor of Hope, uh, I became involved with the Old Town Community Association. We did not endorse adding another shelter to our already saturated neighborhood. When the shelter relocated to lie within the Pearl District boundaries, I became a member of the Good Neighbor Task Force and worked for a year on developing the Good Neighbor Agreement. Um, I, I was that person who, who was the devil's advocate asking, um, what happens when it doesn't work this way, and who do we go to for help? So uh, Saturday, September 10th this year, uh, I was walking down the Greenway with my dog down to the marina where my husband was working. Uh, we had some errands to run, and I went to fetch him up. Uh, I, and I saw him coming towards us, so that was good. Um, he had phoned earlier saying there were some people bathing within the marina, and he had called security on that. Um, so I was a little concerned when I saw a head pop up in front of him. And as I came closer, I saw that there was a man uh, jumping up in front of my husband and pressing into him saying, you murdered my father, you murdered my father, you murdered my father, and I'm just like, oh dear, this is not good. Um, I didn't have my phone with me. I went up into the complex to get someone to call 911 and the, the man and my husband followed up. There were punches being thrown. Uh, I um, was standing closer to the man and he decided, uh, he said to my husband, you're going to sacrifice the woman. And I, before I could realize what the heck that meant, whether he was gonna kill me or what, he punched me in the face. I went down, uh, came up with blood on my hands and my face and my nose was broken. And, um, and him and my husband were, rolling on the ground. Uh, so somebody did call 911, and somebody eventually came out with some mace and sprayed the man, and um, he ran off. Uh, I know that we did the wrong things in that situation. I th thought that I would have known better. I've been attacked before by somebody under the steel bridge. Uh, but in the moment, you know, it's, another, it's an another story. So I'm glad someone did call 911, and I'm glad someone did come out and, and help us. Uh, we don't go out now without our phones and unfortunately without our mace and our tasers. Uh, that's just the way it is. He wasn't a random person high on drugs. He has a history of assault. He has a history of failure to appear. And I'm sorry to say, but I believe he's out on the streets now um, again, which is another one of your problems. I understand. The Harbor of Hope River Div District Navigation Center has brought more campers to our neighborhood, not less. And we are dealing with organized crime. We're dealing with gangs now, car thefts, prostitution, human trafficking. These are elements that come with low barrier shelters and they must be recognized and addressed. And we residents are the ones who are bearing the brunt of these elements. It seems like that there hasn't been anything figured out what to do with the shelters that we have and you want to put another one in. I've been watching your presentations regarding your plans to eliminate street camping. I agree with many of your proposals and I look forward to a reduction in street camping and the eventual elimination of street camping in Portland. But housing in a residential neighborhood comes with the responsibility to be a neighbor. We don't have to be friends but we are not just a resource for cars to steal. 
homes to break into, places to pass out on drugs, and gardens to use as bathrooms. Low barrier has no place in a residential area. I'm just going to quickly um, ask Mr. Mayor, I also heard uh, what you, you ask, uh, what you could do to help people in, in the communities that are affected by these shelters. And I do have an ask for you. And it doesn't cost anything. Uh, McCormick Pier has a pedestrian easement that runs from NATO Parkway to the Willamette Greenway, runs right through our parking lot, runs, people come in, they shop our neighborhood, they shop our gar um, garages, they go door to door looking for doors that are open. We are asking to have permission to close that pedestrian greenway, that pedestrian um, easement, so that we can secure our property. And we are also asking that we can restrict the hours on the Willamette Greenway so that it doesn't have to be open from 5 o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night. I've been working with Commissioner Rubio's office on this. Um, I'm waiting for an answer. Uh, we had a phone call yesterday, and we're still waiting for an answer. So I'm asking if you and the commissioners can give us that permission, uh, simple yes or no. Yeah, and I appreciate happy your to time. Look into Thank that. you. And Bobby, before, before they disappear, can you make sure we have appropriate contact? That's my chief of staff standing back okay. there. So. Good, we'll, we'll uh, be happy to look into that. Thank you. Thank you. you don't, I'm sure we'll have comments, so. <laughs> uh, you, Commissioner Ryan. Do you wanna say something? No, no he's I'm good. good. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Ryan, did you have a comment? First of all, thank you for coming today and being so organized and your presentation was really impactful. As you probably know, um, we, we're building things and then we hand over the keys, if you will, to the county's Office of Homeless Services, which oversees the contract. My, I just have a curious question. Have you also done a similar presentation to the county who has oversight over the TPI contract at Harbor of Hope? Uh, no, but we can. Yeah, we can. And that's because we have shared responsibility. As someone that's uh, jumped into this job, the mayor gave me this lovely assignment, which is a dotted line to the county to, to do something about the crisis on our streets. I think everyone will agree that we need a better first response. We need better on-ramps. And so that's what we're trying to build. I have a question about when you started noticing, um, Harbor of Hope had a lot of great uh, information coming to me in my first six months that for the most part I heard favorable uh, information from the uh, Pearl District Neighborhood Association that the Good Neighbor Agreement was actually fairly good. Did you notice a change in when it it turned a different direction? Um, I, I will say that the, this is my personal opinion. Um, even though it is in the Pearl District, it's about as far out of the Pearl District as it can possibly get. So I'm sure that the Pearl District was pretty happy. It was kind of out of sight, out of mind, maybe not for people at the waterfront. Um, You're Pearl. basically a different neighborhood. It, it's, so they're, they're across the street from us. Uh, I didn't really notice um, anything bad happening directly, but within six months, the, the camps start moving up. I used to be able to go to the door and say, this is part of your good neighbor agreement that you don't allow camping. And they would, you know, they might argue a little, but they'd go out and they'd talk to them, and the camps would go away. They stopped doing that, and... Um, do you know about when that started? It probably started about six months, eight months in. They just they just stopped doing it. I would come and knock at the door, and they just they were rude. They were rude to me. They thought I was rude to them, and um, so. Yeah. No, I appreciate getting more context. Uh, trying to do something in this crisis, trying to build something for the, a humane response to this crisis does include, as you said, being good neighbors. Mm -hmm. So I, I appreciate that we're having this dialogue. We, um, and, and I've experienced that over and over again, where uh, we have to have that accountability from the provider network to the county's joint office that oversees those contracts. And hearing this just gives me more inspiration to stay in those tough conversations. And as we look to adding services, and as we press a reset with the county, we have to be um, at the table ensuring that there's follow-up with these good neighbor agreements. We resourced them last year in the bump. 
but we have a, a culture uh, has to uh, include accountability with those contracts to the providers. I'm not, I'm not placing blame. I'm saying this is what's going on right now. It's very complex, but I think a lot of people sometimes don't understand that it is a shared responsibility and that the city uh, has, uh, we're a donor to the joint office, um, but the joint office is run by the county and they have to oversee those contracts. And um, we're having that dialogue as we open up the Safe Trust Villages as well. And so um, I just wanted to make sure that we had a thorough dialogue on that. Yes. Greg, can I add to that? I have a follow-up yeah. question. Thank you, by the way. Absolutely. Uh, and that's from an average resident perspective. I think that's been part of the issue because someone, we raise our hand and we're like, hey, talk to me more about the shelter and like if there's an issue here. And they're like, well, you need to call this group or you need to call you this You got this, group, right. And you need yeah. to call the county. Exactly. Just from working in corporate America for 25 years, if two groups aren't on the same page, I mean, you got to get on the same page or you're not going to meet your objective. I'm preaching to the choir, I know, but from my perspective, yeah, I don't understand. I, I get frustrated understanding how do we not get there. And I know there was a lot of press recently with your announcement with the candidates for county chair about this. I just really hope you get into a true partnership because otherwise, I mean, I think I sent an email to this effect, and this is me speaking out from an individual basis. I'm like, get out of the partnership. I mean, I would not give money to somebody else who is not aligned with my objective. So I just wanted to add to that. No, I, I appreciate it. This is the type of transparent dialogue we're supposed to have as we're in a crisis. Yes. Yeah, I want to. Uh, it's interesting what you said about the PDNA um, because I know that within the past six months they have actually issued a statement to us saying that they're aware that the GNA has been a failure. And I belong to the Pearl Clean Team. I actually don't clean the waterfront uh, area because, because of timing. They do that during the week. But I know that the Clean Team has been there multiple times. The, once a week, they go out there. Yeah. And I know that they have rarely seen it not have tents. So I'm very surprised that, and this may be on us to follow up, I'm very surprised that you got something from the PDNA saying that things look good. I, I that will... This was, let me be clear with okay. you, this is not recently. This was about a year ago to a year and a half ago. Okay. And what I've experienced from, I go down there and check things mm. out, and I do hear you. It has been different um, of late, and yeah. so I just want to say that. Yeah, and even if I can add just one more thing, yeah. even now, sometimes it's And yes, we are aware that they're against the uh, Safe Rest Village. Yeah, um, the, sometimes you're not aware, like for instance, uh, there was some work on the SRV plot, and so there was a cleanup of a couple of tents there, and the people that worked it may think they're gone. They have moved 100 feet to the other side of the Broadway Bridge. They're still very close to the Harbor of Hope. As far as I'm concerned, they're still in the Harbor of Hope. Uh, plus one block, plus minus yeah. one block. So anyway, thanks. I know the employees at, at Transition Projects are doing the best they can. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that this dialogue is necessary yeah. as we get to the heart of the matter of accountability of contract management. And so that's really helpful to hear. I'm so sorry that you experienced the violence that you did. And we, the gentleman in the picture, <coughs> and the other? My husband. Yeah, okay, so that oh, was yeah. you. Okay. Sorry about you both so look I, great uh, Commissioner today. Maps, go ahead. Uh, uh, where are you done, Nan? Um, I want to just say a couple more things sure, since <laughs> I've been living this um, as the person that I know you had that experience last night, but as a person going out there, uh, listening to the community for the past year and a half, taking every shot you can take as everyone's angry and frustrated, and I understand that. Um, I do know that the Safe Rest Village team in earnest has been meeting with some of you or many of people. So I know that they've been doing their own dialogue. So I just want to so lift. I, yes. I know that was part of our, our um, presentation that maybe slipped out, but and the, I know stakeholder I meetings, yep, so. the stakeholder meetings are not public. They are with um, businesses and they, they have a few very select people who are invited to those meetings. They're private, people can't just go in. There's no minutes produced, they're not available. They're not transparent meetings and they're not meeting with the community. Okay, I, I hear you and I believe you. So I will, I will do this. My chief of staff, Kelly Torres, is, is in the room and we will have a, a, a follow-up meeting and it'll include um, the hardworking people from the Safe Rest Village team, so. Yeah. I'm so sorry, can I add on to that too? Yeah, yeah. so yeah. 
completely agreed. Because I've reached, as soon as I heard about the Safe Rest Village, I was excited like everybody else. Like, hey, we do need shelters. Housing first is taking way too long. Uh, but when I was like, hey, what meetings do we get to be a part of? They were like, basically the essence was no. It's city and county agencies who are responsible for aspects of the Safe Rest Village. And to Kat's point, a few select residents. I'm sorry, to me, that is not a stakeholder meeting. That does not include neighborhood residents. And I, I don't understand why we're left out of this process. Yeah, I know uh, I've been to a couple myself, and I know one was fairly, it wasn't just stakeholders, it was the Pearl District Neighborhood Association. Well, I went to one of those. <laughs> were so you with that one? That up. It was a Safe Rest Village team. I think you were on your honeymoon, by the way. If, if that's the case, congratulations. Uh, but it was a Safe Rest Village team. Oh, it was before that. It was it. Oh, well, yeah. I went to one. <laughs> It wasn't a Q and A. This, it, to be very honest, the Safe Rest Village team just told us what was happening. People were asking questions; they were not getting answers. People genuinely wanted to understand the program and how, the details. They were not given answers, and so that's where I think the frustration is. So yeah, the team can easily go. We had a meeting. It's like, was it a real meeting, or was it just telling us? And that's the that's the feeling. No, you deserve to be listened to, and we'll, we'll make sure we follow up. And the one I was speaking to was well before that. Okay. And there that's were a lot of people. I was on Zoom. There were hundreds of people. Oh, I think I know which one. Yeah, I didn't make that. And all the yeah. press was there. It was, yeah. yeah. I've been to a few of those, yeah. And they're important. And people definitely express themselves. Commissioner Maps? Um, yes. Uh, I just want to jump in here for a moment and thank all of you for coming down and sharing your story. Um, I also want to thank you for your patience and, frankly, your bravery for um, sticking with Portland uh, despite the challenges that uh, we face. Uh, Kat and Tom, I am so sorry um, for what you have been through. No Portlander um, should be the subject of um, the kind of violence that you have been, um, uh, that has been inflicted upon you. Um, I'll tell you the truth, um, the, 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 the siting of the, the, the micromanaging, the siting of uh, Safe Rest Villages is kind of outside, the, um, outside of my portfolio for the most part. However, I think every member of council, including myself, has a responsibility to help keep our um, streets clean and safe. Um, I feel like there's some conversations that um, I'd like to have with you and I think uh, council needs to have around how we can work with this neighborhood to uh, just deal with the public safety and quality of life issues. One of the things that I would encourage you to do is if you could just send me a note, uh, um, and I know I think I have a stack of paper this thick from you already, but if you could send my office an email so we can establish a uh, line of communication, I'd appreciate that and what I will do is I will uh, work with my colleagues on council to. Um, I can't say we're going to fix all of your public safety problems, but I, I, I believe that you deserve better service than you're getting today, um, and you deserve a clear um, statement from us about what we can do and what we can't do. Um, so I'll be working. I see so there's some staff here from the Community Safety Division, so uh, those folks should probably be expecting an, an outreach from me um, on these issues. And of course, I'll be working with Commissioner Ryan and the Mayor's Office and uh, Commissioner Rubio uh, um, to um, make sure that we can marshal the resources that we need in order to um, make the Pearl District a place that all Portlanders uh, can enjoy. Both housed and unhoused, and um, thank you, and please stay safe. And I just want to end with saying that I really appreciate that you all came today. I'm well aware of these situations. I've been in so many conversations. I know that it's not your portfolio, so you, you have no idea what we've gone through, and we're with you. And I do think that there was a change of culture, um, perhaps at that venue. You know, there's leadership changes, there's changes at the joint office. And it's, it's really important that we get to the bottom of why I heard from so many people that things changed at the Harbor of Hope, especially over the last year or so. And so it, the timing couldn't have been worse, of course, as we're trying to offer more services to get out of this ditch that we're in. And I really appreciate you coming. It was very organized. It was very well done. It has a lot of impact. I'm glad it woke all of us up. Um, I've been on this for a while, but it allows me to look at it differently. And so I'm sorry you had to go to this length. Um, I do know that I responded with a letter in July to some of the concerns, 
And I will say that the meeting that we'll have that will include people from the Safe Rest Village team, they're doing the very best they can to get to the bottom of all these questions as well. And we also need to include the shelter provider leadership um, of, of TPI in that meeting, don't you think? Okay, great. Yeah, accountability and transparency. So sorry you endured the violence, thanks. So I haven't gone yet, and, and I, I definitely want to say something. Uh, first of all, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. It was a good presentation, and um, I apologize for the personal trauma that you've experienced, the violence that you've experienced, uh, the circumstances that you and your neighborhood have been exposed to. I'm keenly aware of them, and I want you to know I'm stepping up to do something about it. The five resolutions which the city council passed two weeks ago, I believe is a good start. It's a necessary start. And it starts with a controversial proposition, one that I believe in very, very deeply, which is that we must end self-directed, unsanctioned camping in the city of Portland. We must. Not just because it's the right policy, but because I think it is the right moral and ethical thing to do as well. I do not believe the circumstances that currently exist on our street are either moral or ethical. They are not humane for vulnerable populations living on our street. Now, I'm not making excuses for people and their bad behavior, but I also have to acknowledge that in a state, and, and the governor should be here, and the governor-elect should be here, and the legislative leadership should be here standing here with me in a state where we have willfully neglected and willfully failed to fund, staff, and support either a mental health system or a substance abuse treatment system, we are now reaping what we have sown. This is what we get for our neglect. And vulnerable people living on the streets they are also paying a price. The individual that you described, I'm, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a psychologist, but it doesn't take a genius to figure out that they're struggling with very severe mental health issues. They deserve to be in a place where they get help and not be in a place where they're likely going to end up dying, which happens to dozens and dozens of people on our streets every single year. Likewise, you should not have to be threatened. You should not have to be physically assaulted by people who struggle with these circumstances, whether you know, it's a substance abuse issue, a mental health issue, or whatever. Um, what, what it is is sort of beside the point. The fact is it exists and it's happening openly on our streets. And we need to do something about it. And I decided to step forward and do something about it. And that's what the core of those resolutions are, it is me saying um, that the status quo has failed. It no longer works. It, it, it's not at the scale that it needs to be. It's not providing the right kind of interventions or preventions. The Joint Office of Homeless Services, I have serious problems with it. And it's not all their fault, by the way. But the, the main problem is nobody wants to be in the mud with us. We're in the mud. We deal in blood, we deal in mud, we deal in mental health issues, we deal in substance abuse issues, we deal with human feces, we deal with naked people running down the street, people who are unable to even acknowledge who or where they are because their afflictions are that serious. And it is beneath us as a moral and ethical society to have that happening in our community. And therefore, we need to do something differently. And I have tried to paint the most blunt picture I can. It's not good enough to have, as Commissioner Ryan said, and I, I really support his efforts, by the way, and I, I do have to acknowledge, I gave him the worst assignment on the city council. I did. I gave him the toughest assignment. And I did it because I know he has the leadership experience to be able to pull it off. If anybody can, Dan can. And, and he has my complete support. And we, you know, we've made mistakes. We, we're all acknowledging that. Uh, but he has my support and he'll continue to have my support in this effort. But where, where the joint office has really not worked, in my opinion, is we haven't agreed who cleans up the mess. 
who is responsible for the manifestations of this humanitarian catastrophe on our streets. We've taken it upon ourselves, but it costs a lot of money. The litter collection, um, maintaining the, the security in these sites. Uh, there, there are now 800 encampments over 146 square miles in the city of Portland. And so it does not surprise me when homeless individuals report back to us or to others that nobody's ever approached them about treatment opportunities or housing opportunities or shelter or anything else. I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised that there's litter all over this city. How do you clean up litter in 800 different encampments spread over 146 square miles on a regular basis? You can't. And that's the genesis of these larger encampments where people will have access to basic dignity and hygiene and litter collection and with the support of the county, we can connect them to mental health and substance abuse treatment and other services that are the purview of the county that are funded by the federal and state government through the county, where the county has expertise in these areas where the city does not. You're completely correct. We have to make this partnership work. And I want to give you some encouragement. Um, I'm really encouraged by Chair-elect Jessica Vega-Peterson and the early meetings that we have now had and the commitment she has made to our resolutions and to this city council, I believe that we will be able to work together in a more effective way going forward than, than uh, what, what you have obviously seen and which has been the truth for the last several years. We have not been able to work together well because we have not been able to agree on what the problem is. And I've just outlined from my perspective what I believe the problem is. Um, hearing you here actually encourages me. It does not depress me. It does not upset me. I do not take it as criticism. It encourages me. It makes me want to dig deeper and fight harder for the heart and soul of this city. And I really appreciate when I hear people come in to this council and say, I chose Portland. I love Portland. I'm still committed to Portland. But things are a mess. We have to fix it. And you're committed to working with me and working with this council. Um, th this is the best thing that will happen to me today, is you being here. And I really appreciate it. Commissioner Ryan. Again, thanks for being so organized and telling a great story. It woke everybody up. I want you to know you're, not, you're representing neighborhoods throughout the city. We have unsanctioned camping where people are untreated and in trauma and are causing a lot of harm to themselves and others throughout the city. So the specifics around the shelter, not living up to the good neighbor agreement, diving into that for sure, based on this conversation. I hope you can hold that the entire city's dealing with this. So your voice for the people that live in Lentz, the voice for the people that live um, near Marine Boulevard, it's all over the city we're dealing with this. And I just wanted to acknowledge that that it's not just a problem in this specific part of town. And so thanks for that voice. And also, a note to all of our colleagues, we have to start using the word we. I can't fix this. Mayor can't fix this. We can inspire and work together as a team. It's the people's money. It doesn't matter what coffers it's in, whether it's Metro, the county, or the city. We have to come together to focus on this crisis. It's a we effort. And I am hopeful, like the mayor, that we have a reset with the recent elections. Can I just, can I, I just have this thought, and I, it's not new, I've had it several times, but in your speaking, um, and, and in using the pronouns we and ours, you know, I think is like really a, a great thing. One thing in, in that, that you include, you have, um, you have a large contingency of people who can be helping you with this, and this is the people on the streets. Um, and having expectations for them to help you solve the problems, having expectations from them to help clean up the litter. We don't have to do all of that. It's, it's something that we as the people living on the streets can be um, encouraged and expected to take a part in their recovery and in the recovery of the city. And I would really hope that you would include those in your camps that you have, that you don't have to come in and clean up their mess. They have to clean up. Yeah, and, and in all fairness, and I, yeah. I should say, many do, many do. 
Um, you know, we're, 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 I'm, I, I I'm have sort of, seen some who, who do. Yeah, I'm, I'm responding really to the comments um, of you know, those who are the most severely afflicted with mental health or substance abuse. But you're absolutely right. There are many, many people on our streets who work with this and uh, are, are, are very diligent in making sure that their camp is clean, that it's secure. But the, the problem is we as the municipal government have a larger responsibility to the population at large. It's not, you know, one, of, one of the areas that's, one of the, the things that's important to mention is although it's a catastrophe for people living on the streets, this is also very traumatic for neighborhoods, for residents, uh, for people with disabilities who want to have access to a sidewalk, for people who just want their kids to be able to walk to school safely, for people who want to go visit a local business uh, or an employee who wants to get to work safely. Everybody has a right and an expectation of safety and cleanliness in this community. And while the homeless population represents you know, less than half a percent of the total population of this city, it is now impacting everybody. And I hear it loudly, and I hear it clearly, and I hear it every single day. And so while you're here expressing your concerns about a very specific place, um, you represent the entirety of this community. There are many, many people who could watch this on TV. I, I don't know how many people actually do watch this. But some number of people, and they're probably sitting here shaking their heads listening to you speak, going, yeah, I, I can relate. They, they may not live in the Pearl District, they may live in Lentz or somewhere else, but uh, I know you speak for many, many thousands of people in this community. I, I really appreciate your being here. Thanks. I really do, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, last statement from me, I promise. Uh, no, you're right, it, it's, it's citywide, we all know it. it's not a secret. I used to live up in Kenton, love that area. I saw it near my place up there. Uh, I just wanna say, I support your resolution. I do, and I understand y'all are voting on the funding today. I'm very excited about that. I think that is a step in the right direction. I know it was probably an unpopular decision from some perspectives, but I think you have overwhelming support. Everybody I've talked to, I think you've gotten tons of comments that you support it. It is a step in the right direction. It's where we have to go. What we're doing is not working. Uh, I do wanna wrap up and go back to the gist of our presentation. We already have a shelter in our neighborhood we have issues that are not managed we're asking you please do not put another shelter in our neighborhood i just want to get back to that and make that abundantly clear and last thing i want to thank you for your time today thank you very much yeah. for your time and your dialogue yeah and, and on your way out kelly torres uh, is here and, and she would like to meet with you and a couple people from the safe for us village team if you have time oh, what was her name i'm oh, sorry uh, kelly torres you want to okay. wave there she is yeah okay. Great, and, and Great. Well, you mentioned a petition that came to my office. I, I don't know what happened with that, but we can follow up. Uh, we can look for a follow up, but yeah, I got confirmation. I wasn't gonna say something without being confirmed. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I absolutely A batch it. of, uh, I think total of 600. We can get the specifics. Yeah. Okay, well, Bob, Bobby's back there shaking, so. Paper. Yeah, you know, I, I don't. I don't need you to collect another one. I just. I don't <laughs> You're know, sure? I don't know why, another one. I'm just saying. I don't know why there right, was yeah. no response. I don't know. You can look at mine. Yeah. Good. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate Thank you. it. Thank you. To the no. consent agenda, um, I'm going to continue item uh, 987. Keelan, that requires four votes. We don't have four votes, so I'll continue that to next week. Otherwise, uh, have any other items been pulled off the consent agenda? No, that was the only item. Please call the roll. Oh, actually, we're not voting on the consent agenda. Oh, because that was it. Okay, got it. Never mind. Okay, two, our first time certain, please. Item number 985, please. Adopt the West Portland Town Center Plan Goals and Policies, Visions, Action Charts, Land Use Concept and Circulation Growth Concept Diagrams, and Coordinated Growth Strategy for Zoning and Infrastructure, Amend the Comprehensive Plan, Comprehensive Plan Map, Zoning Map, Title 33, and Citywide Design Guidelines. Thank you, colleagues. We're back today for a final vote on the West Portland Town Center Plan. As you'll recall, we held a hearing on the plan back on October 12th. We took testimony until October 14th. We considered and then voted on amendments to the plan on October 27th. Finally, on November 16th, we voted to approve the as-amended ordinance 
and findings of fact report for the plan and move the plan to a second reading and final vote. Colleagues, is there any final discussion on this before we do call the vote? Seeing none, Keelan, please call the roll. Maps. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Wheeler. I shared some brief remarks when this was at council two weeks ago, but I'm glad to have an opportunity today on our final vote to say just a bit more. I want to thank the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability for their work to develop this plan and for the intentional collaboration with a number of community-based organizations that serve and represent specifically underrepresented communities. And the dedication and the involvement of those organizations, including Community Alliance of Tenants, Unite Oregon, Hackey Community Organization, as well as Neighborhood House. I also want to thank the many community members who participated in this effort. Thank you also to the Bureau of Transportation, the Bureau of Environmental Services, and the Housing Bureau for their specific collaborations and efforts. I also want to thank the Multnomah County Health Department for their involvement and guidance as well as Metro for their support of this work and the vision of an equitable Southwest corridor. I think this is really terrific work. This plan provides the first steps and the foundation for reimagining and building a more equitable and resilient future for the community in this area. I'm very happy to support this effort and the building of better social, economic, and health outcomes for all in this new town center. I vote aye and the ordinance is adopted. Thank you, that concludes this particular item. Next item, 986, a proclamation. Proclaim December I'm 1st. sorry, um, uh, Commissioner Ryan's asked for a two minute break. We're in recess for two minutes. We will reconvene at 1025.
when the business up here in the front of the room. Next item, time certain, please. This is item number 986, a proclamation. Proclaim December 1st, 2022 to be World AIDS Day. Commissioner Ryan. Thank you for the introduction, Mayor. And colleagues, I'd like to start by thanking our invited guests who are up at the dais here at the table. Jim Clay, who manages the Aging Well program at Cascade AIDS Project. Brett Conry, who is an active member of Portland's HIV community and a volunteer at Cascade AIDS Project. And Ian Morton, who is executive director of Portland's Q Center. And I'd like to turn the floor over to our honored guests for their remarks to get us started. Good morning. Um, Mr. Mayor, commissioners, thank you for inviting us to speak on this occasion of World AIDS Day, always December 1st and has been for the past 34 years. Um, I'd introduce myself. I'll give you both my personal and professional uh, reasons for being here. Personally, I'm a Portland resident. I've lived here more than 30 years in inner Northeast Portland. Um, I'm a 75-year-old gay man. Um, I've been part of the HIV community for more than 35 years. I'm a widow, which is possibly one of my key identities. And professionally, I work for Cascade AIDS Project. I conducted a needs assessment and then designed and now manage a program called Aging Well, which supports older adults who are living with or affected by HIV. And we're here today to share the meaning of World AIDS Day. Um, so what is the meaning? Well, the answer is it depends. It depends over time it has moved. It began as a solemn time of remembrance and commemoration. It was a time to express our rage, observing that silence equals death. It began as a time to remember all of those who had been lost and all of the painful and ugly struggles that we had endured. 700,000 people died. I'm sure it's not lost on you that that's more than the population of the city of Portland. All dead. Playwright William Hoffman was asked once, could he summarize his experience of the earliest days of AIDS in 10 words or less? No small challenge, but he nailed it. He wrote that it was a time of mass death, brutality, and human indifference. And then gay historian Hugh Ryan was also asked the same in fewer than 10 words. He said simply, we let people die because we didn't like them. And so World AIDS Day is a time to recall with righteous anger all of those who share some responsibility for our great losses. I lost all my friends, all my friends. I lost most of my community. I lost my husband, Mark. I love speaking his name. But it's only fair, and it brings us some relief to remember the heroes and the angels of that time as well, because there were those. Larry Kramer, Elizabeth Taylor, Michael Callan, to name just a very few. Oh, and a, and a very young, very young, Tony Fauci. Lately, World AIDS Day has become something else. It's become an opportunity to reflect on the advances that medicine has made so that we can dramatically change the trajectory of this epidemic, of this plague. We look ahead with optimism at promising new treatments for the newly diagnosed. But what about those of us who have been living with this plague and are left battered by 30 or 40 years of experiencing the virus, of experiencing the human difference, indifference, and the, the absence of activism on the part of our federal government. And ironically, have been battered by 30 or 40 years of the very medications that promised us wellness, and yet, at times did more harm than good. We're aging prematurely. 
And many of us, having been told that we will die an early death, did not plan for retirement. So many lives were lost. But I think the one thing that we want to leave you with here today is that some of us are still here, what we call in the HIV community long-term survivors. Many of us are widows. Many of us are alone. Being a gay man from, from the earliest years, there was no opportunity for adopting children, for forming a nuclear family, for even uh, connecting with a spouse. It, it was very rare for that to happen. And now, in our 60s and 70s, some of our program participants are in their 80s. We're living alone. So when I learned the Cascade AIDS Project was interested in supporting older adults who were still living with AIDS, who were still living, but who were still living with HIV, uh, they asked for a needs assessment. They asked for somebody to go in the community, do a little bit of talking and a whole lot of listening, and find out what were the needs and the strengths and the experiences of older adults living with or affected by HIV. Now, having worked for decades in human services, I worked for 10 years in the office of the county chair, so I'm much more familiar with the county side of this, with the health department. It has been a joy lately to see this new approach that nobody ever saw coming. Nobody saw coming that we need to not only be working with the health department in Multnomah County, we need to be working with aging and disability services. Nobody thought we were going to be aging. Nobody thought we were going to be here. We didn't think we were going to be here. So the world is a really different place right now. So I was asked to do this needs assessment based on the needs assessment. Um, I took all the, what I had learned in human services for three decades and designed and then implemented and now manage a program called Aging Well. Walking advertisement. It supports older adults living with or affected by HIV. A lot of what we do is community building. Finding connections for older adults who are living with HIV, who are affected by HIV, who are alone, disconnected, and need a social support, who need a family, who need a community. That's what we do. So as I started thinking of this, I realized neighborhood development, community building, that's really starting to overflow into the agenda of the city of Portland. We're looking for your support. We understand today you're considering a proclamation where you would declare your support. We have some really concrete ideas, or maybe you have some concrete ideas of how we could go about that. I'm hoping sometime in the future we can have a discussion about what that could be. Because we've got a program in place right now. I, frankly, I will claim that it's highly successful, and it's doing great work, and it's doing important work. And if you would like to be engaged with this and support this, we'd like for you to be, be with us. So thank you for your consideration of World AIDS Day. Thank you for consideration of older adults who are living with or affected by HIV. Thank you all. Um, can I introduce for, first Brett, who came with me, who's a, a very active volunteer and a participant in the Aging Well program. Good morning. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to address you today. My name is Brett Connery, and I live here in Portland. In December of 1985, nearly 40 years ago, I became HIV. I was 27, and my life changed dramatically. By 1991, I was sick. I was unable to continue working. At 33, I lost my career, and my health insurance was gone. I was dependent on public health care for specialized health. By 1995, I was diagnosed with a rare and deadly form of cancer. There were some drugs that were new, and they were still experimental, and they helped. I survived it. We didn't find out the long-term effects of those drugs until 2003, when I had my first heart attack. I can't remember how many times I've had to change my medication. My need for health care is never going to change. 
My demand for services through aging and disability is just increasing. Last month, I turned 64. I don't have a retirement plan. What I have is Social Security disability of less than $1,100 a month. It's programs offered through Aging Well that provide me with socialization, education, a place that I feel I belong, and a family. It's advocacy from organizations like CAP, Cascades Age Project, I still need. World AIDS Day is complicated for me. It's a time that I reflect and I remember so many lives lost and their suffering. I also remember their encouragement and their inspiration. They taught me not to give up. They taught me to fight and not to lose sight of hope. I'll honor their passing by celebrating the success of this disease and acknowledging that I'm one of the first group of survivors. One of the ways that you can honor their passing is to reconnect with your own commitment, your duty, and your obligation not to forget those of us who survived. Thank you. Ian, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Ian Morton. My pronouns are he, him, and his. I'm the executive director of Q Center. And first, I need to say thank you to the both of you for the work that you do and the example that you set. Um, my own beginnings in nonprofit and advocacy world were in the HIV community. Um, I came out at the age of 19 in 1993, still a few years before trials started for what we now know as the cocktail. Um, and myself and my roommate, Melissa Moore, were doing our best to do prevention education in Knoxville, Tennessee. And yes, cities like Knoxville, Tennessee were very behind the scientific curve. So it was very impacted by what was coming from the churches. Um, my own mother, after I came out to her, the last thing she said before we spoke for another four years was, when you're dying of AIDS, don't call me. This is part of the shadow that many gay men in particular in the United States have uh, on their back as they move forward. And when I moved to San Diego, I took a job at an HIV specialty pharmacy, and like uh, Brett had said, medications were changing all the time, and even as a clerk, I was fighting with insurance companies to try to get new drugs approved for people for uh, their previous ones were no longer working, and that's where I really learned how to fight for people. World AIDS Day, yes. It's such a complicated, complicated day for so many of us. I, I woke up this morning and realized that I didn't have any more lapel pins. Um, and the spool of red ribbon that I had always kept has been repurposed for my niece to do craft projects. And I was a little embarrassed because I felt like I had performed some sort of betrayal. Because I certainly know as, as I've worked in the community, we always said never forget. And today is that reminder of what we carry with us, of what we lost. Uh, the, the artistic and vibrant and beautiful souls that we were burying week after week. So I appreciate the city acknowledging World AIDS Day. I appreciate the continued call to action coming from organizations like Cascade AIDS Project and Q Center is here to also be a part of that conversation and a partner uh, with those who are wanting to make these resources available and um, uh, amplified for the community. And so Jim, I'm thrilled that I'm meeting you officially today. And uh, thank you for being here and thank you again to the both of you. Thank you, Jim and Brett and Ian uh, for your leadership and your in the community and the work that you do each and every day, and especially this morning for telling your truth. Colleagues, I invite any of you to make remarks before I make mine and read the proclamation. 
Uh, Commissioner Ryan, um, first I want to thank our panel for that really powerful presentation today. And to my colleagues and the people of Portland, I want to say that I, I am proud to join you in proclaiming December 1st, 2022 to be World AIDS Day here in Portland, Oregon. As we've heard, since 1988, World AIDS Day has been celebrated on the first day of December. And as we've heard, the purpose of this day is to raise awareness of the AIDS epidemic. The purpose of this day is to mourn those who we have lost to this disease. And the purpose of this day is to focus the world's attention on ending the HIV epidemic. Uh, now, in the last 40 years, more than 36 million people have died of AIDS-related illnesses. 700,000 of those people were Americans. On World AIDS Day, we mourn those who we have lost to HIV, but we also celebrate and support those who are living with HIV. Today, an estimated 37.7 million people around this globe are living with HIV. Here in the Portland metro area, more than 3,500 residents live with HIV. On World AIDS Day, we remember that there is hope for our friends and neighbors living with this disease. Thanks to recent improved access to treatments, the death rate from AIDS epidemic has decreased 64% since its peak in 2004. Today, people living with HIV who seek treatment early can expect to live a near normal lifespan. And there is more good news. Thanks to the steady march of science, ending the HIV epidemic is within our reach, which is why on World AIDS Day, Portlanders rededicate ourselves to the goal of ending the AIDS epidemic. And on World AIDS Day, Portlanders renew our commitment to stand with the nearly 38 million people around this world living with HIV. And on World AIDS Day, Portlanders remember and mourn the friends we have lost to this terrible disease. Colleagues, that's why I am glad to join this DAC Council in declaring December 1st, 2022 to be World AIDS Day here in Portland, Oregon. Thank you, Commissioner Ryan. Yeah, well, gentlemen, uh, I want to extend my thanks as well. Um, Jim, Brett, and Ian, thank you for being here today. Thank you for sharing your stories. This has actually been an extraordinary morning at Portland City Hall, hasn't it? People are, are telling their stories. They're uh, engaged in, in courageous acts. I think telling your personal stories are acts of courage. And I want to thank you for that. And I'll also tell you that for each of you here telling your stories, there are many, many others in this community who are energized and lifted and encouraged by the stories that you've shared with us today. It is an important day. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the important work of your respective organizations, the Cascade AIDS Project CAP, um, the Q Center. Uh, you do terrific work in this community. And, and I just want to say personally, Jim, I'm really energized that, that you're now in this phase of looking at older adults. There, you know, there's a larger theme that we've all been working on, on how to make Portland an age-friendly community for everybody. And this is an important component that you've, you've shed light on today for the council and for others. Uh, and I just want to say I really applaud and support the work that you're doing. Uh, Ian, the Q Center has, has been a rock in this community for so many people who, who are out to see um, who, who, who find companionship, who find camaraderie, who find common cause in your institution. I really want to thank you for the leadership you and your organization provides here in the community as well. Um, so I, I'm just happy to be here uh, and uh, share the spirit of this moment with you to acknowledge the trauma and the battles of the past, the neglect of the past, but also the hope that you're expressing for the future. I think it's an encouraging time 
and I appreciate your being here to, to reflect it. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Ryan. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Commissioner Maps, for those comments. Uh, as a long-term survivor of HIV myself, it'll be 39 years in mid-December. I'm, first of all, just grateful to be alive and to represent those who died too soon, as I attended, as you all did, way too many funerals in, in the 80s and 90s. Today, I'm fully aware I stand on their shoulders. I know you do, too. And I ask that we all take a moment of silence as we think of those that we lost and we loved with HIV. Thanks. In addition to HIV, for those of us who identify as gay, and especially for those of us born before Stonewall, that's pre-1969, for the youngsters in the room, Life has offered a lot of painful experiences, many, too many to count. And while random and sometimes frequent waves of fear, of, of violence, um, the hate and the fear and the shame, and they were, they were all tossed at us at once. I'll never forget, and as Nietzsche once said, um, what won't kill you will make you stronger. So I'm looking at some really strong people in front of us today. We came together. We built systems when government was extremely slow to respond. We protested with compassion and love. And yeah, we, we did some jail time. <laughs> and we eventually, we were heard. I want to thank my family. I was fortunate. My family was supportive. And they always accepted and supported me. My employers, who I always asked for confidentiality because I wanted to be focused on the mission I was serving. I didn't want it to ever be about me. However, when I ran for office, I felt like it was my duty to be honest about being a long-term HIV survivor to help lift the stigma. But my employers protected my privacy and allowed me to be judged on my ability to perform and get results for whatever mission I was called to serve. And they never saw me as a liability, as a victim, or a handicap. My doctors, even a couple who I had to fire because they wanted to have me take some drugs that I thought were bad for me. Um, to my, the nurses, thank goodness for the nurses, and the caregivers who helped me survive several rough patches. One was in 1995. That's when I was told I had just months to live and to make plans. And that's what prompted me to move back home. And Portland's my hometown. And then soon after, as is mentioned, use the word cocktail, the advances, the scientific advancements kept me and so many others that I'm sitting in front of today alive. So I'm just so grateful to be alive, to be serving my hometown during a time of crisis. And for me, doing life now as a newlywed to a spouse. Thank you, Amo Reyes. We just got married in uh, September 4th. So clearly, I was built to handle adversity, and that goes for all of us on this dais, and to all of you. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, constituents. And most important, thank you to the fellow HIV survivors. What a blessing to take a moment to be present and acknowledge World AIDS Day. And now I'll read the proclamation. There's always a part in this where I, I say that I'm the mayor, but that's the mayor, <laughs> but it's in here. Just want to give you that warning. <laughs> Whereas, 41 years ago, the first documented cases of AIDS brought about an era of uncertainty, fear, and discrimination. And whereas, far too many people living with HIV or AIDS have faced prejudice or bias. And whereas a lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, asexual, and two-spirit community, specifically men who have sex with men, have been most targeted and infected by HIV or AIDS discrimination. And whereas, World AIDS Day was first observed in 1988 and focused on the world's attention on ending the HIV epidemic, reducing stigma around HIV AIDS, and increasing awareness knowledge about transmission and treatment. And whereas public outreach and education about HIV and AIDS, such as wearing red, continues to be a vital tool to bring more awareness about this ongoing global epidemic, and whereas the decades since those first cases, with ingenuity, leadership, and research, and historic investments in evidence-based practices, we have begun to move toward an era of resilience and hope. And whereas today, 
the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services recognizes racism as a serious public health threat that drives and affects outcomes and disparities for HIV AIDS. And whereas black and Latino Americans are most impacted by discrimination, lack of access to health care, and whereas in 2018, black Americans represented 12% of the U.S. population, however, they accounted for 43% of new HIV diagnoses and an estimated 42% of the people living with HIV. And whereas HIV AIDS impacts black, indigenous, and people of color at disproportionate rates due to racialized stigma, homophobia, and transphobia within and outside the localized communities. And whereas individually and collectively adverse experiences affect all people of color's ability to access healthcare and stay engaged with the healthcare system. And whereas a Portland metro area is home to more than 3,500 residents who currently live with HIV or AIDS. And whereas community-based programs led by organizations like Our House, Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon, Q Center, and Ainsworth United Church of Christ have provided resources and support to reduce barriers for people living with HIV or AIDS. And whereas Cascade AIDS Project, the oldest and largest community-based provider of HIV services, housing, education, and advocacy in Oregon and Southwest Washington was founded in Portland. And whereas, because of antiviral treatments, people living with HIV who start these therapies early in the course of infection can now expect a near normal lifespan. And whereas, the city of Portland supports the leadership of networks and individuals living with and affected by HIV AIDS and the advocates who continue to fight. And whereas, the city of Portland recognizes that ending the HIV AIDS epidemic is within our reach, and we are committed to rising to that challenge. Now, therefore, I, Ted Wheeler, Mayor of the City of Portland, Oregon, the City of Roses, do hereby proclaim December 1st of 2022 to be World AIDS Day, and we encourage all residents to observe this day and support, show their support for people affected by HIV or AIDS by wearing red. Thank you, Commissioner Ryan, for reading the proclamation. Thank you for being here today. We appreciate it very much. Thanks, Jim. All right, we will move to the regular <coughs> agenda 988, please. Amend the FY 2022-23 revised budget and make other budget related changes. Colleagues, this is the second reading on the general fund contingency allocation ordinance of the fall budget monitoring process, also known as the fall bump. Council passed the technical portion of the fall bump on October 27th. Today we'll vote on the budget proposal I brought to Council on November 16th, which focused on how to allocate our general fund contingency funds. As a reminder, on November 16th, we heard a presentation, we heard public testimony, and then Council amended that proposal in three specific ways. First, we accepted substitute exhibits one, two, three, and four, allowing for inclusion of the budget allocations predominantly discussed with the Council during the work session back on November 10th. Second, we included Directive E, which was waiving city financial policy FIN-2.03, which typically requires 50% of the general fund discretionary to be reserve, reserved for infrastructure maintenance. Third, we included Directive F, which refrains from advancing $7 million currently allocated to the Joint Office of Homeless Services, pending Multnomah County's vote this December on a proposal to put $15 million towards rental assistance and eviction legal defense financial assistance. If the county does not approve that funding proposal, the city will reappropriate the $7 million towards rental assistance and eviction legal defense financial assistance. With that, colleagues, is there any further discussion on the fall bump before we call the roll? Seeing none, Keelan, please call the roll. Maps. Colleagues, I'm glad to vote yes on this ordinance. I vote yes because this ordinance makes extraordinary new investments in homeless services. 
With this ordinance, this council follows through on a commitment we made to set up new safe rest campuses, which can house up to 750 Portlanders who are currently living on the streets. In addition, this ordinance provides funds to keep those campuses and adjacent homes and businesses clean and safe. And this ordinance creates a 50-person navigation team charged with connecting houseless individuals with social services. Now, I do not claim that the investments we make today will end Portland's homeless crisis. However, I do hope that with the investments we make today, uh, we can mark the beginning of the end of Portland's homelessness crisis. Colleagues, for these reasons and more, I vote aye. Ryan. Colleagues, the five resolutions we passed earlier this month are a significant step to serve all Portlanders. Far too long, we have tolerated the intolerable and our current conditions on our streets and our parks are not sustainable. We must build a much better first response to this humanitarian crisis that is impacting everyone in our city. And we must humbly admit the current system needs improvement and have the courage to take that action. We have heard in these chambers from a very loud, passionate section of Portlanders that are not supportive of these resolutions. To those who came to testify, I hear your concerns, but I also want to level set what the mood is throughout the city. All of our offices have received nearly 1,000 calls and emails in support of the action this council is taking. We can't keep talking about the homeless people as one segment. We have to remember our homeless population is as diverse as our housed population. Those, though, there are those that are living on our streets that simply could not afford to continue to live in their homes. There are those who are escaping domestic abuse and there are those who don't have the means to get into housing. We need to identify these groups and get them into housing quickly. We cannot pit homeless services against affordable housing. This is a false narrative. It is not an either or. We can and must do both. These resolutions allow the city and the county to bring services to the homeless population we currently aren't serving, as well as have as we have campsites throughout the we aren't serving as we have campsites throughout the city. We need a first response system with efficient outreach and services. We will accelerate the development of 20,000 units of housing that we desperately need. The permit system is improving as we speak. It was a broken system this council inherited, and we are on it. Through our partnership and collaboration with county officials, we will launch a diversion program for our homeless population to create a pipeline that provides homeless Portlanders a path for work and careers out of poverty. Let me be clear, these resolutions do not criminalize homelessness. What is criminal is for government to continue to accept the status quo that has really accelerated over the last five years. That being said, there are some hard truths we need to acknowledge. We have a mental health crisis that needs to be addressed at the state level down to the local level. The simple equation of having proportionally the largest number of untreated untreated for mental and behavioral health and the fewest number of treatment facilities is a reality we must accept and improve. We have a fentanyl and methamphetamine epidemic where we need all levels of government to invest in detox facilities. We have to be honest that there is a population on the streets that are suffering from mental health and drug addiction and we cannot allow this to go untreated. Our state, our region, and our county, and our city is suffering. Our small businesses are closing. We have larger businesses that are having trouble recruiting employees due to the conditions on our streets. The seed funding coming from this council makes me proud. The people's money is there to invest in this crisis and to this, and to this uh, system improvement. No one cares where the money is currently housed. It's the people's money, and there is plenty of it at Metro from the Here Together tax and at the county who receives these, those funds just as they receive a majority of a general fund over the years from the city to run the county's Office of Homeless Services. The money is there to improve the first response system, to improve on-ramps to permanent housing, to provide more transition housing so those who are homeless can build resilience through treatment, through sober living, 
and move to a path of workforce and housing consistency. Yes, our future workforce will be led by those who we serve today, those with lived experience. I have been listening to the community, and that is a broad, inclusive word, community. It requires listening beyond the houseless industry, beyond the special interest to receive support from the industry. I have been in the hot seat all over the city on this topic since I was elected two years ago. Like me, the mayor had the integrity to do that just last night, listening to those in the central east side. It's time to be responsive to the greater community and build a first response system today. Today, we take that big step to invest in this improved system to build on ramps, to ensure shelter, and provide humane services. It's time to humbly admit we can and must do better. And I listen to those who are homeless, starting with my brother Tim, who perished on our streets almost a decade ago, in addition to a nephew who has been homeless much of the past decade. And I will always listen to those who are currently homeless. And that is why I carry this, it's a little duck. When I was campaigning recently, I was able to meet a woman who is homeless, and she stays positive by holding on to this duck. She gave me one. She said she squeezes it and tells people she's ducky, and it helps her stay positive. She's had to leave our shelter. She's had to leave our single occupancy units, apartments, because she never feels safe. She just asked me to provide shelters and provide housing where she can feel safe so she can be back to being independent again. She is my inspiration to not accept the industry's status quo plan to wait until we have enough housing. We must act now. I vote aye. Wheeler. This package funds the implementation of charter changes. It supports day-to-day -day operations and it addresses our community's challenges with both homelessness as well as public safety. This package allocates approximately $27 million to the commitments Council made on November 3rd when we passed the Affordable Housing and Homelessness Resolution Package. I hear and I acknowledge the concerns and the upset that many Portlanders are expressing over the creation of these sanctioned sites. I've also heard and seen the hundreds of messages to my office that have supported this work. These sites will provide life-saving shelter and services to our most vulnerable, and they'll do so at the scale required to make a true difference in our community. This is not a perfect solution, but it is a solution responsive to the reality that we face. Five-year wait lists for affordable housing, rampant rates of severe mental health and substance abuse, and a lack of availability for treatment, as well as a progressively dangerous and unsanitary set of conditions within unsanctioned camps across our city. The city just simply cannot wait for a perfect solution. I know that leading on this issue, while critical, may not be received favorably. Doing what is right is not always popular. With that, I'd like to thank Director Jessica Kennard and the City Budget Office for your hard work on this budget process. I also want to thank all of the Bureau and Council Office staffs for the work that you all did putting together these packages over the last several weeks. And finally, I want to thank my colleagues for your thoughtful engagement in developing a package that reflects the bold change needed to make a meaningful difference in this community. I vote aye. The ordinance is adopted. Next item on the regular agenda, 989 please, this is a report. Next up bid of more excavation ink for the North Jansen Avenue west of North Pavilion Avenue water main improvements project for $1,534,790. Colleagues, this work authorized will by this item will replace approximately 2,200 feet of pipe as well as install new fire hydrants and water services, reducing breaks, outages, and potential backflow and contamination. Chief Procurement Officer Biko Taylor is out there somewhere in the ether to walk us through the report. Biko, good morning. Good morning, Mayor Wheeler, City Council. Uh, for the record, I'm Biko Taylor, the City's Chief Procurement Officer. 
Um, City Council on February 23rd, 2022, approved Ordinance 190719 on behalf of the Water Bureau to complete this project. At that time, the engineer's estimate for the project was $1.326 million with the confidence level that was deemed high. Procurement Services issued the invitation to bid on September 23rd, 2022, with a due date of October 25th, 2022. In total, we received three bids on this project. More Excavation Incorporated was the low bidder and it's a recommended awardee. Their bid came in at 1.534 million, which is approximately 15.7% above the engineering estimate. The city's standard 20% aspirational goal applies to this solicitation. And the following is a breakdown of the utilization that was submitted for this project. 78.97% of the project work, work plan will be performed by more excavation and 20% of the project will be completed by certifi certified COVID subcontractors. Even though this contract includes 20% participation for COVID firms, less than 12% was allocated to minorities and only 1% to African-Americans. I urge firms like Moore to change their philosophical approach on these low bid projects. I also urge infrastructure bureaus to meet with Barry and Concrete and seek a curated approach to providing opportunities for this small African-American female-owned firm to grow. Please partner with procurement and the procurement's uh, inclusive contracting management team to solve this problem. I also applied more for their efforts in, in, in meeting the 20% certified COVID goal. More excavation is located in Fairview, Oregon. It is not a state cert COVID certified contractor. If there are any questions about the procurement process, I'm happy to answer them. If you have any questions about the project scope itself, we have Water Bureau partner Jody Inman in attendance as well. If not, I recommend that the council accept this report and authorize the execution of this contract. Colleagues, any questions for Director Taylor at this particular point? Keelan, do we have public testimony on this item? Uh, we have one person signed up um, online, Carol Van Dyke. They're they're not, they haven't joined us. I just want to make sure they're not in. Carol, are you out there? Yeah, okay. I, I, I'll entertain a motion to accept the report. So moved. Commissioner Maps moves. Can I get a second, please? I'll second. Commissioner second. Ryan seconds. Any further discussion? Keelan, please call the roll. Maps. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Wheeler. All right, the report is accepted. Next item, 990, please. Accept and appropriate grant in the amount of $63,500 from the State of Oregon Transportation Safety Office for the English as a Second Language Driver Program and Authorized Future Transportation Safety Office Grant Program Agreements. Colleagues, traffic crashes involving people whose first language is not English have grown in recent years. This grant helps provide culturally competent driver's education by teaching driving skills and laws and languages other than English. This is a common sense way of reducing traffic crashes through education that meets the diverse Portland community where they're at. I'll pass this over to Captain Abrahamson to present. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor, Council, thanks for having me. I'm David Abrahamson, I'm a captain here at East Precinct. Uh, and I'll actually provide some history here. Uh, let me know when those slides pop up for you. In the PowerPoint. Yeah, they're up. Next slide, please. And Mayor, you kind of already touched on this, but really the scope here, it's to equip those who have not been provided with any training or driver education. And as I'll get to, uh, there is nothing in place outside English or Spanish in a driver manual or even for hands-on hands or classroom education here in Oregon. Um, next slide, please. So in 2013 and 2014, I was assigned to the traffic division overseeing the crash team, and I reviewed every single crash report that took place in the city of Portland. I made death notifications to victims, uh, both for fatalities and also for a couple hundred uh, serious injury crashes that were life altering. And we began at traffic to see a consistent thread in meeting with victims' families, where a lot of the victims who were um, a lot, oftentimes not even, they weren't the at fault party, 
involved in these crashes had never provided any kind of education and they were self-taught drivers. Um, we met with Department of Motor Vehicles uh, seeking uh, potential opportunities to expand the translation of the driver manual. Uh, and unfortunately that was not available then and still is not available to us now. Uh, we began meeting with uh, community organizations, uh, with our immigrant populations, with Russian speaking network, Latino network, Slava Council, Apano, ACO, and a myriad of others, just to listen and hear where the need was, if there's something they wanted. Because again, we didn't want uh, to come with our agenda of what we saw identified. We wanted to hear from the community. And there was an overwhelming outcry from the immigrant community asking for training and education. And in different communities, there was different requests and different uh, trends. And so based upon this, next slide, please. We started meeting with uh, government entities, with Oregon Impact, uh, Portland Bureau of Transportation, Oregon Department of Transportation, Oregon Driver Education Center, which is out of Salem. Uh, and they have um, a formatted education program, which is just state of the art, and it's been accept accepted by DMV. And just asking them, can we put something together with our community partners, really to, again, as a, as a platform um, where people are equipped, uh, they aren't afraid of uh, the laws of the road, um, and they're able to, to really vet and navigate our, our roadways here safely. Um, some of the benefits from this in 2015, 2016, I uh, just want to provide recognition. East Portland Action Plan provided the first two grants for this program, and we held three classes every year with approximately 40 to 60 students. Uh, it lasted five weeks for each class. It takes place, took place and takes place at the training facility. Uh, and then in 2017 and 2018, I want to thank the city for, through the micro and macro grants that were available, for also supporting the continuation of this program. And then in 2019, uh, I think we only had one class and then COVID came and it's been on hold the last couple of years, but we have had a dozen requests from our community partners to hold these once again. And based upon their request, that's why we're proceeding. Uh, so far, I think about nearly 800 New Portlanders have had, uh, attended the previous course. And we're equipping them with a day or two of, of classroom education uh, through Oregon Driver Education Center, through our government partners, providing uh, you know, information on uh, bike safety, pedestrian safety, uh, just the laws of the road, uh, breaking down the pretense of the police uniform, what to expect on a traffic stop, uh, what typically are officers going to ask on a traffic stop. If they don't understand, how do they ask and request uh, for an interpreter for that conversation? Uh, what are their rights legally, even for search and seizure? Uh, how do they file a complaint if it's a bad contact, right? Even through the court process, how they seek uh, different opportunities like diversion classes and other things like that too. Uh, and it's been a great catalyst for us. In 2018, uh, from large outcry from the Russian community, uh, we partnered with Portland State's University Russian flagship program. Uh, and for literally nine months with interns that the city brought in too, in conjunction with Portland State, uh, they actually uh, translated uh, the driver manual into uh, into Russian, uh, which has been well received and appreciated. Next slide, please. And, and just take maybe five to 10 seconds for each slide over the next three slides. This has been a, a, just an opportunity for the city to step into a place where we're engaging with our diverse communities. But oftentimes for police, it, it's difficult unless it's just on a call, especially with limited staffing now, right? And community engagement. Uh, you can continue on, on the next few slides. 85% um, of all students who've attended have been women. And they have never had the opportunity in different, uh, based upon culture norms, to even step into that driver's seat behind the wheel. And that first week when we have this class, they see that police uniform and you can see that, that there's fear of police. And over the next four weeks, there is that pretense broken down. There's greater understandings for our members. We get to hear the stories and their experience from their cultures. Uh, and we have a myriad of officers that represent the diversity of the police bureau come in. Some who immigrated into the US who share their stories about how they became a police officer. And it's been a great catalyst uh, for us too. And as you can see there on the bottom right, this is the backside of the 10 acres of the training facility. They are provided information on the first day on, on, on really how to um, even set up a vehicle to determine if it's safe to use, how to maintain it, uh, how to check uh, different fluids. Um, and, and then we go into backing, we go into uh, coursework, lane changes, everything's under 30 miles an hour, but they're having hands-on instruction with one of Oregon Driver Education Center's instructors 
who does this full time on a regular basis. Next slide, please. And then last slide, if you can. And again, these have been a catalyst for understanding and for greater relationship. Uh, again, we don't want to see an off the shelf program. We want to know the communities we serve. Uh, not only are we breaking down fear of police, but we're equipping people to, uh, to function safely here on the roadway systems. And there's tons of fear. People still have to drive. They still have to be unemployed. Uh, we've had reduced, through these classes, we've had reduced uh, uh, companies, insurance companies, provide reduced uh, rates for people that complete this course. Uh, so my ask is that uh, through Oregon Department of Transportation, uh, funding this, that uh, the city approves this course. Any questions? Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, colleagues, any questions? Do we have any public testimony on this item? No one signed up. Very good, Captain. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate it. Looks like a great program. This is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Thank you. Next up, item 990. This is also a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. I'm sorry, I'm wrong. 991, um, also a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. Authorized competitive solicitation and execution of price agreements for staff augmentation to support the Bureau of Environmental Services Capital Improvement Program for an amount not to exceed $28 million over five years. Commissioner Mapps. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Colleagues, this ordinance authorizes procurement to conduct a competitive solicitation and award price agreements for temporary staffing services that will support the Bureau of Environmental Mental Services Capital Improvement Program. Here to tell us more about this uh, ordinance, we have Amy Chomowitz with Environmental Services. Uh, welcome, Amy. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Mayor and morning. Commissioners. Uh, there is a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, if you've got that queued up, that would be great. Thank you. Um, my name is Amy Chomowitz. Uh, she, her pronouns, I'm a long-term City of Portland uh, employee with the Bureau of Environmental Services. Also, Rick Nossman is here with us virtually. Uh, he is with procurement to answer any questions that might come up. Next slide, please. So before I uh, get into the details of the solicitation itself, um, I'd want to mention that uh, with Council's approval of nine FTE uh, in the fall bump, we were able to make substantial reductions in the temporary staffing contract capacity and we especially want to thank Commissioner Mapps and Michelle Rodriguez for their leadership and their support. Having those additional FTE will make a difference. Uh, we anticipate um, finding, we, we anticipate some difficulty in finding temporary uh, professional upper level staff, engineers, project managers, um, and uh, having the, the additional FTE kind of takes the pressure off these uh, temporary staffing contracts. Originally, the contracts were scoped with a capacity of 40 million and a, and a total or maximum staff of 35 temporary staff. However, the new FTE allowed us to reduce the capacity of the contracts to 28 million, and we also reduced the maximum number of temporary staff um, that we could hire through these uh, to 20. Additionally, we'll reduce the number of contracts from 10 contracts total to six, um, which makes contract management more streamlined and reduces the workload for staff who uh, will be managing those contracts. Future requests for FTE will enable us to stay within the authorized contract amount. If the FTE are not approved, we may need to come back to council to request increased capacity, but hopefully that's not going to happen. Next slide, please. So let me talk for a moment about why do we need this ordinance? Uh, why do we need temporary staff? So our storm and sanitary infrastructure is aging. Many of our facilities have reached the end of their lifespan. To ensure continued reliability and to prevent costly emergencies, these facilities need to be repaired or replaced. The progressively increasing workload requires a comprehensive solution that will put FTEs, consultants, and temporary staff to work on critical asset projects. The focus of this ordinance is on the temporary staffing contracts. So these contract employees will perform design engineering, project management and controls, and facility planning on a regular and as needed basis. These on-call um, staffing services help the Bureau design and 
and construct projects including sanitary and uh, sto sorry, storm and sanitary sewers, wastewater pump stations, wastewater treatment facilities, stormwater treatment facilities, and drainage way improvements. Additional staff are needed to maintain the Bureau's increasing uh, CIP project output. Next slide. So currently, we have five contracts that provide us with mainly construction managers and inspectors. This RFP will replace those existing contracts, which expire on June 30th of next year. The contracts that result from this RFP will provide us with the capacity to bring in these supplemental personnel who are needed to address our increasing capital program, but there's no guarantee that we will use up that entire capacity. This is not a new approach for us. Um, we have had large temporary staffing and on-call contracts for many years, at least 10 years um, in the past. Next slide, please. So these contracts, they've provided us with opportunities and partnerships that support workforce development in the engineering and construction fields in general, and they support the BES workforce. Over the years, we've seen many outstanding candidates, uh, including graduates from local schools like the University of Portland, Portland State University, Mount Hood Community College, OSU, U of O, et cetera. So these contracts are really one way, uh, one of several ways that uh, we get staff into BES. Temporary staff get experience, they build skills, and they often compete well for city positions when we have openings. Um, over the past five years, BES has hired 30 former temporary staff into permanent positions when we've had those vacancies. Often we find candidates may not have applied for a government hiring process for a variety of reasons, but their experience as a temporary contractor opens up this career path for them. And we, we gain by drawing on regional and national pool of candidates with specialty experience that we need for our specific projects. These are often senior staff who mentor junior staff on large and complex projects. So, so far, BES has been working with the procurement equity team to identify potential co-bid or certified firms that may be able to um, supply us with the temporary staff that we're looking for. And moving forward, we'll continue working with the equity team. We'll hold a meeting before the RFP is issued to identify potential barriers and opportunities for certified firms. We also will have a non-mandatory pre-bid meeting where we'll respond to questions about the RFP. And to try to be more inclusive in the RFP, we increased the number of points allocated to equity and diversity. Next slide. So um, I want to thank you for your time, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Colleagues, do we have any public testimony on this item? No one signed up. All right, very good. Thank you for the presentation. This is the first reading of an non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to skip ahead just for a moment, just so I don't forget this. Can we do 993? It is a second reading. Authorized bid solicitation and contract with the lowest responsive and responsible bidder for construction of the Fulton, Fulton Pump Mains replacement project for an estimated cost of $4,700,000. Any further discussion on this item? Seeing none, please call the roll. Maps? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. The ordinance is adopted. Last item for this morning, item number 992, first reading of a non emergency ordinance. <coughs> Authorize the Portland Water Bureau to acquire certain permanent and temporary property rights necessary for construction of the Bull Run filtration projects through negotiation or the exercise of the city's eminent domain authority. Commissioner Maps. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Colleagues, this ordinance authorizes the Water Bureau to start negotiations for easements needed for the construction of Portland's new water filtration plants. This ordinance is necessary because the city of Portland is required to build a new water filtration facility in order to comply with federal and state safe drinking water regulations. The purpose of this facility is to remove sediment, organic material, and other potential contaminants in the water that Portlanders drink. 
In order to comply with state and federal water quality rules, this facility must be online by 2027. The ordinance before us today is an important step towards fulfilling this mandate. Here today to tell us more about this project, we have Jody Inman, uh, Chief Engineer for the Water Bureau's Engineering Services Group. Welcome, Jody, and guests. And guests, yes, thank you very much, Commissioner Maps. Um, again, Jody Inman, Chief Engineer of the Portland Water Bureau, and I have with me Dave Peters, hey, Dave. who is the Executive Director for the Pro Bull Run Treatment Program. Um, he's here, he's the expert on all the details on this in case you have questions and also in case I erupt in a fit of coughing and need to leave, so my apologies. Um, I think, yes, uh, the uh, presentation is at PowerPoint. All right, so we are here today to request authorization to acquire certain temporary and permanent property rights necessary for construction of the Bull Run treatment facility and the pipelines. Next slide, please. So just as a reminder, um, the, not that you need reminding, but the Portland Water Bureau is building a filtration facility to new pipelines to help the Water Bureau comply with Federal Safe Drinking Water Act regulations, and it is to be completed by September of 2027. We are already halfway through our 10, more than halfway through our 10-year window. City Council chose filtration because of the many benefits it offers to further protect our health, support our economy, and prepare us for the future, keeping our water safe and abundant for generations to come. For our health, when we talk about for our health, we're talking about using proven treatment methods to deliver clean, safe drinking water to customers and keeping that water safe and abundant for current and future generations. For our economy, these projects will create thousands of Portland area jobs and increase opportunities for people of color and women in the construction trades. That focus on economy also means that we are focused on maintaining water rate affordability. For our future, enhancing our water system's resilience, reducing future risks, and better protecting our customers. Because if the last few years have taught us anything, it's that we cannot predict the future, but we can be better prepared. Uh, we also know that while we are all in the same storm, we are not in the same boat. And so these projects have a lens of improving outcomes for historically underserved communities and keeping our commitment to climate work. Uh, since this project started, I'll just note that we have faced record high temperatures. Um, before this project started, I had never heard of a heat dome, and that is now becoming all too often of a uh, common terminology. We've seen increased fire risk and fires that even bordered our watershed. Larger rain and wind storm events, as well as ice storm events. Reliable access to clean, safe water has never been more important because we know <coughs> excuse me, that there are those who can't pick up and move or go to a hotel or buy bottled water in an emergency, and we are trying to keep them centered in what we do. Next slide. Um, so you've probably seen our system multiple times, but again, why we are doing these, um, it is not only for those benefits that I mentioned before, but we are required to uh, construct these improvements to meet federal drinking water standards. Our bull run supply has had long-standing protections on it since 1892 of the watershed itself and disinfection, which was added in the 1920s. For these specific, for the Bull Run Treatment Program, we include, there are three capital projects included. The Improved Corrosion Control Treatment, which came online in April of 2022, or April of this year. <coughs> and then the Bull Run <coughs> Filtration Facility and the, uh, the pipelines that will connect it to our system. Next slide. So a brief update on the program status. We have a bilateral compliance <coughs> agreement with the Oregon Health Authority, which has three distinct milestones. We recently met on time, on schedule, the second milestone um, by submittal of our design of the filtration facility this past October. While this was a critical uh, compliance milestone, it is not the only key milestone that is a part of successfully delivering this project on the full compliance deadline by September of 2027. <coughs> So while not on the slide, I wanted to make note that one of the other key actions that occurred this past year was submittal of our land use application to Multnomah County in September. This is uh, one of the critical factors to us being able to move forward with the facility and move into construction. Um, we have a team of experts on our land use team, a very large and robust team of experts that work diligently to submit a nearly 3,000 page land use application, say 3,000 pages, 
Multnomah County, actually we worked with them and they hired a consultant to help be able to process that application. Um, and we submitted in October, which starts a multi-step process. Um, we are also on track, we are in two counties, um, so we are on track to submit a much smaller land use application to Clackamas County by the end of this year. Um, the land use process, as you may or may not know, is highly participatory in Oregon and includes multiple steps. It is extremely common for projects to have to go through two or more submittals to be able to get a completeness certification. It is very common. Um, sometimes it's used as a way to create more time for staff to be able to uh, process the application. We are in the process right now of responding to our first set of comments for completeness um, to be able to resubmit that. Um, we do anticipate, even through that, to having a land use decision by the summer of 2023. And we do and have included in our schedule the potential for an appeal. Like the land use process, acquiring easements is also a necessary and critical part of this project. Acquiring easements is a process that can take 14 months, up to 14 months, sometimes longer. It is not a fast process. This project also uses federal funding, so there are a number of steps that are required for the acquisition process. And this council action is one of the first critical steps in starting that process. And it is key to helping us stay on schedule. Next slide, please. So a little bit about how we um, selected the easements that we are here before you today. We recognize that acquiring easements, both temporary and permanent, across private property is not something to be taken lightly and impacts the community and the property owners. Therefore, in the process of designing and revising the design of the project, we prioritized using public rights of way wherever possible to avoid impacts to private property owners. Where easements are needed, we really focused to uh, we really uh, focused on being able to use temporary construction easements, thereby minimizing our, minimizing our impact, and also looking at minimizing the number and size of the permanent easements that we are going to be required to use. Um, some of the other steps that we used to minimize impacts were placement of the easements, um, some of the easements that cross property, for instance. We located them on existing farm roads to minimize in, yeah, impact to crops or what areas that farmers may be able to farm. And of course, we will be restoring all property to at least pre-construction conditions. And again, all federal and state acquisition rules will be followed. Um, and we have had multiple outreach to the property owners impacted already. Um, we've met with them. They are aware of the easement um, and have begun discussion on mitigations. You know, again, just the easement process, the acquisition process, what we are here today is the first step to allow us to, again, open negotiations. Um, so we do anticipate, and it is our full intent, to reach and negotiate a, a, um, an easement that is acceptable to both parties, and only if required and needed would we actually exercise eminent domain. That is part of the reason why it is critical for us to complete this first step now, is so that we can begin and allow enough time to have adequate, thorough, and collaborative conversations with those property owners to maximize the potential of reaching mutual agreement and not having to go through a legal route. Um, next slide. All of that prep work to show you where the easements are that we are going to be acquiring. Um, you can see on the map the area highlighted in uh, blue is where the actual filtration facility will be located. We are currently working with six property owners. Some of the property owners own multiple properties, um, which is why there are more easements than property owners. We will be acquiring nine permanent easements, or just over 12 acres, and that's for the pipeline, pipeline tunnel, an above ground inner tie facility and access, and eight temporary construction easements. You can see on the, um, if you look at the map, the uh, just going south of the Water Bureau property, there's a kind of pinkish purple uh, couple of areas going south. Those easements are for the permanent access road, emergency access road that is required by land use. Um, those will be permanent easements. If you uh, can see on the map, the area going off to the right of the filtration facility is necessary for pipeline and our tunnel, which will be connecting the filtration facility to existing conduits. 
And the area in the upper left is again necessary to be able to connect the finished water coming out of the plant to the multiple conduits that we have serving town. The little box at the top is the area, only area on this where we will be having an above ground structure, which is our inner tie, where we take the two pipes coming out of the facility and interconnect it to three pipes serving town. And with that, that is the end of my presentation, and I'm happy, or we are happy, to answer any questions you may have. Colleagues, any questions? Yeah, we have quite a lot of public testimony. So why don't we go to public testimony, three minutes each name for the record. How many folks do we have signed up? Uh, we have seven people signed up. Okay, very good. Uh, how are our closed captioners doing? Can they hold out till noon? Yeah. They're good? Okay, yeah. let me know if they're not, if they need a break. Okay. We're okay. Why don't you go ahead and call people up? Thank you. First up, we have Commissioner Mark Scholl. Yes, uh, good morning, Mayor Wheeler, Commissioner Maps, Commissioner Ryan, and the people of Portland. Uh, I speak to you this morning as an individual commissioner from Clackamas County, not on behalf of the Board of Commissioners. And I'm here to represent the concerns of ratepayers and property owners in Clackamas County in the areas of Bull Run, Cottrell, Orient, Boring, and Sandy, as well as with concerns for our neighbors in Multnomah County. Our citizens live in the fifth highest cost of living state in America, and we are concerned about the effects on water bills should the filtration plant be built. The threat of tolling, inflation, potential recession, the high cost of living, and now the potential for a four or five time increase in water bills simply unaffordable for many of our families. I have spoken with residents who have used Bull Run water for 70 plus years, and they never had a bad glass of water. So does the cost to benefit for this expensive plant justify further pressure on our family finances? Are there other solutions, such as under sink filters for families that may have a vulnerable family member. Would that save us from a billion dollar plus project? As a county commissioner, I'm elected to stand up for the interests of the people of Clackamas County, and I urge the city of Portland to reconsider the potential negative impacts of proceeding with this project, this costly and controversial filtration plan. Let's use some common sense and responding to the Federal Clean Water Act, an act that should be more focused on Flint, Michigan and other cities with serious water problems, not on the most pristine water source in America. As for the issue of easements on our very valuable farmland, again, I urge the city of Portland to stand down, reconsider, and look at the quality of life of our people and, the work, and work with us to keep down the cost of living for our families and maintain the productive and beautiful farmland our people value so much. I thank you for your time this morning and for your concerns for the families of Clackamas County. Thank you. Uh, next up we have Gabriel Schoening online um, or in person, nope. Uh, let's go to D. White. Hello, can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. All righty. Uh, my name is D. White. This eminent domain agenda item is yet another <coughs> raw display of the Portland Water Bureau's arrogance and untrustworthiness. We have just started the holiday season when Portlanders are even more distracted and anxious than we already are. During these times, the Water Bureau and the city always, always unleash their calculated moves, such as this land grab. This land grab, which will directly affect six property owners in our rural community of <coughs> Mount Hood, is another example of the Water Bureau, Bureau putting the cart before the horse for one of their ill-conceived, misguided, and corrupt 
infrastructure boondoggles that will provide no measurable health benefits as well as skyrocketing unaffordable water bills <laughs> for decades to come. Commissioner Maps, the Water Bureau's proposed $1.5 billion filtration plant with its miles of pipelines is not a viable project and should be terminated. It has not been approved by either Multnomah County or Clackamas County. The land use application was rejected by Multnomah County and is now back at the Water Bureau for better answers. Unsurprisingly, the application is full of holes because there is so much wrong with what the Water Bureau is doing here. The Water Bureau is gaslighting and building <coughs> the rural communities of Pleasant Home and Cottrell and beyond to get their way. This is a bucolic rural community, mostly farm and nursery land with longtime property owners, young working families, raising children, retired folks. Do not think for one second that there's not going to be a fight and do not think for one second that the $6.6 .6 million allocated here is going to cover the cost for this shaky land grab. Much of the ratepayers' $6.6 .6 million monies will go to the Water Bureau's lawyers. These property owners, along with the entire rural community, are fighting for their livelihoods, their property rights, their family security, and their happiness. Meanwhile, Portland Water Bureau has ongoing high lead in water results. They had a federal lead in water exceedance less than a year ago, the highest level of lead in over 20 years. The 1991 lead and copper rule states, lead in tap water is to be minimized to the greatest extent feasible. It's 30 years past time that the water, Portland Water Bureau started following the law instead of abusing it and harming us, both rural and urban residents. Thank you. Next up, we have Suzanne Korcher. My name is Suzanne Corder, and I live out um, in the area right near where the Water Bureau is proposing their project. Um, I'm here today. <clears throat> First, I'm going to address some comments earlier. Yes, the federal government has asked that the water be treated. It doesn't choose how it's treated. It doesn't choose where it's treated. That all lies on the lot, hands and shoulders of the Water Bureau. <clears throat> um, people live out there feel like they've chosen a poor spot. We live in a rural reserve area. We shouldn't have to be dealing with impacts from Portland out there. Um, and so I'm gonna say for, I'm gonna be honest here, for the last three plus years, people have been threatened about this land use thing. People have been threatened about having their property have easements on it. Every time that anyone I've spoken to or anyone I've heard about said when they've been approached they're not offered enough money to make it worth it. And at the end, they always slip in, or we could do eminent domain. So that's what I'm here for today. I think the eminent domain request is premature. I'm not saying it doesn't have to come at some point in time, to be honest. If, but they don't have a project. They don't have land use. They don't have a complete um, application done. And they're trying to take this land, and you know darn well if they get it, they're never giving it back to those people if the, if the land use never goes through. So um, my comment is here for the people that have been fortunate enough to buy a house out there, for most of them, their major financial investment is in that land and that property. Um, and they're coming, you know, and they're not going to get equivalent of what it's worth. I'm talking also about the nurseries that are impacted out there. They're not only at risk of losing land, they're at risk of losing part of their livelihood. So this is a big thing. And so um, until land use is done, I think this needs to be tabled. I don't think, because it's not only Multnomah County, it's Clackamas County, I don't think eminent domain possibilities should be addressed before there's a final viable project. Um, and to capture one of your comments from earlier today, Mayor Wheeler, I say that um, 
it's not moral and ethical to do this prior to actually having a project. We've been terrorized out there for way too long. People are fighting, and to have the Water Bureau keep saying, we have to do this, we have to do this, they don't have to do it there. They don't have to do it that way. And they need to not keep going ahead of the project by taking people's land, their livelihood. That's, I have the people, all my neighbors, all my neighbors are having their land directed in that project that you just saw there. So please do not approve this until there is final land use. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Uh, next up, we have Chris Quarter. Welcome, Chris. Thank you for being here. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Chris Quarter. I live in on Dodge Park in Boring, Oregon, where it's no longer boring. But uh, regardless of where you stand on the proposed project by the Water Bureau. Some of you are for it. We know that. We've heard you talk about it. Some of you are against it. And maybe some of you are in between. But right now, that's, and that's OK. But this is the wrong time to grant them any eminent domain. They are so far from getting the permits that they need. They're so far from ever doing any real work on it, if it ever does get that far, which I don't think it's going to. They like you to think that. They want everybody to think this is a done deal. It's not a done deal. And so for them to uh, tell my neighbor, I, I see the stakes. I live right next to this. Here's 100 feet of stakes marked off probably for two or 300 yards. We're taking this land from you. At this point, that's, uh, that's really sad. It's worse than sad. I, I, you know, there's obvious uh, finagling on their part. They want, it's another part of this is a done deal. They're not, they're not close enough to be asking you for this, so I'm hoping that you don't grant that to them. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your being here. Welcome. Hi, can you hear me? Yep, loudly and clearly. Welcome. All right, thank you. Um, my name is Lauren Quarter. Um, I am a property owner and also an acting committee member for the Cottrell Planning Organization in Clackamas County. <laughs> Commissioner Matt, the ordinance you present today states, quote, the projects have been planned, designed, and located in a manner that is most compatible with the greatest public good and least private injury. This project is intended to serve nearly 1 million water customers. However, it is now well known that your water customers are dwindling fast. Do you and your constituents know that the city council and its predecessors chose the most expensive location because they didn't want to put it in the backyard of Portlanders? The city's solution was to put it out in rural East County with the least concentrated numbers of people, thereby checking the box of least private injury. Yes, there are less of us with it than within the Portland city limits. But the least private injury you were trying to avoid is resulting in the greatest financial public injury. Commissioner Maps, you and the Portland City Council will be associated with the most expensive water filtration project in the country and that growing one and a half billion dollar price tag will be paid by the ratepayers for generations to come. So far, the city council has granted the Water Bureau permission to spend hundreds of millions of ratepayer dollars for a project that is not viable. The Water Bureau's land use application has been deemed incomplete by the county. The Water Bureau does not have land use approval. And this proposal, um, as acknowledged by the Water Bureau, will be, end up in the Land Use Board of Appeals and the likelihood of further legal action. It will be years, years before the Water Bureau will have a viable project. Yet here we are discussing property acquisition and eminent domain for a project that has an uncertain future. For the last three years, your Water Bureau has been terrorizing us, individual landowners in our community. 
This ordinance is more of the same. Do you know who the Walters, the Bissells, the Burke holders are? Do you know how big of an economic risk or ask this is from surface and extra nurseries? These are families that have invested their lives into their properties, businesses, and this community. Did you know that one of the easements that the Water Bureau wants, wants to, it's an access road that runs heavy equipment right next to an elementary and middle school? The answers are probably no, since you have not genuinely taken the time to know where you want to solve your problem and how it will impact the people that live there. This ordinance is completely inappropriate to ask at this and in all decency, please revisit this agenda item when you have a viable project. Thank you. Thank you. Our last testifier is Sean Narison online. Go ahead, Sean. Sean, are you able to unmute? Sean, if you're on the phone, you can try star six to unmute. Sean, would you prefer not to testify? Yeah, I, I don't think they're gonna testify. All right, very good. Colleagues, any further comments or questions at this point? Uh, I guess I do have a question. Um, a, a number of the people testifying had indicated that it is premature to request or enact eminent domain. Could you, could you talk a little bit about that and the timing and why, why is that not reasonable to wait until you have the approvals in place? Of course, I Mayor. Mean, pr presumably you can use eminent domain at any time. Yes, um, the eminent domain process, as I mentioned, is a long and extensive process. Um, really all we're asking for is the authority to start the conversation and to have some guarantee that we will be able to reach a successful negotiation. Um, so that is the intended process. As I mentioned, it takes 14 months, longer or shorter, depending on how the negotiations go. The land use process, so if we start from today, that would be early 2024, when we would anticipate potentially being at the point of bringing back or going into or signing easements for those acquisitions. Our land use process, we will have uh, mid next year. The land use process, you will get a decision from Multnomah County, and then from there, it is really up to the applicant to decide, even if the project is appealed, whether they want to move forward with the project or not. That is a very common, um, especially for large projects like this, it is a very common occurrence for some components of a project to go on to be appealed. Um, but typically that is very narrow window on what the appeals are for. So the timing is critical because if we wait until we get through the land use process, then essentially we'd be delaying. We are unfortunately at the point where if you can imagine in less than five years to have a large filtration facility and miles of pipeline in place, functioning, commissioning, and delivering water is getting pretty tight. So if we have any hope of meeting that compliance schedule, delaying ourselves nine months to start a 14-month acquisition conversation um, would put us, we would definitely be having to go back to OHA and ask for, ask for an extension to our compliance schedule. Okay, and, and uh, so I guess I'll just our... clarify, we will not be following through on easements until we get through land use. Okay, so that, I, I guess that's my question. So what, what guarantee can you give that that is the case? I mean, understanding that generally people don't trust government and yes. to say that, hey, give us this authority, but we're not going to execute on it until we have the final approvals. What, what can you offer people that guarantees that? Well, I can offer my personal guarantee. I'm not sure if we have, if there's any legal component of the process. Um, 
Maybe Mr. Mr. Mayor, as long as I have the bureau, I can, I can, uh, I will hold myself and the bureau accountable for, um, uh, for um, not moving forward until we have engaged in a dialogue with the property owners and done everything that we can to make sure uh, um, that uh, this project has the least impact on residents as possible. And I, I would also mention that, you know, there is a cost to these easements. So if for some reason things did not go the way we fully anticipate them to go, we would not be wanting to expend water ratepayer funds on property that would have no benefit. Okay. Um, and uh, first legal counsel, and then I believe the last person who wants to testify was able to connect. Uh, but legal counsel first. Yes, um, Mr. Mayor, I wanted to mention that a um, fundamental component of eminent domain is necessity. And if there can't be the filtration plant built there, there is no necessity. So the eminent domain would not survive a legal challenge in that instance. Ah, that's helpful. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks, um, and Keelan, we have, we have one other person to testify. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah, let's check to see if they're available. Sean, were you able to unmute? Doesn't look like they're going to test. All right. Well, Thanks. we tried. Uh, any colleagues? Any other questions? Very good. This is the first reading. It moves to second reading. Thank you. Thank you. Does that complete our business for this morning? It does. All right. Thank you for your patience. Our closed captioners, in particular, we are adjourned.